So after our brief look in this spice market or the Egyptian market if you prefer we're going to take a short walk over to Rustam Basha Mosque. Our route takes us down these interesting streets where we can get a brief glimpse of the real Istanbul. You remember that the Yeni Mosque which we have just seen and also the Blue Mosque had a market built with them whose rents supported the mosque. Well, the same applies to Rustam Pasha, with a little difference. The old 16th century city was so crowded that the mosque is built on top of the shops which support it. You'll see how shortly. And here you are, the shops on the ground floor and the mosque above. We'll climb the stairs to see that the courtyard has been replaced by a little terrace and a double porch. I am told that this mosque, being so close to the Blue Mosque, the Yeni Mosque and Suleymaniye Mosque is often overlooked by visitors which is unfortunate really, because apart from its unusual position, which is worth seeing, it is one of the mosques built by Sinan. Indeed, it is said to be one of his most elegant works. Practically every available area inside is covered with the best Iznik tiles, and here is just a selection. There are geometric motifs, as is usual, but I am told that the predominant theme is the Paradise Garden, with delicately painted tulips, hyacinths and carnations. Construction of this mosque began in the 1550s, about 50 years before the Blue Mosque and the Yeni Mosque. It was commissioned by Suleiman the Magnificent's son-in-law, who just happened to be Grand Vizier. His name was Rustam Pasha, and he had married the Sultan's daughter, Miramar Sultan, who we shall meet again later. Before we leave, let's have another look at this porch. Some more Isnik towels here, obviously. So what we're going to do now is walk back to that square near Galata Bridge, have a sit down and watch the local birds And if we turn around now, you can see where we are. We've got Galata Bridge to our right. And we're now going to look at the shoreline down there. And the main attraction in this first section is fish restaurants. Here, the fish comes practically straight out of the water onto these boats here. Fortunately, you don't have to sit on these boats to eat it. This is where the preparation is done. I'm afraid I wasn't brave enough to try some. I'm not a fishy person, really. If it doesn't come coated in batter and wrapped in newspaper, I'm lost. So while you're enjoying your fish restaurants, let me just tell you that when you're finished, the next thing we're going to do is catch a ferry and ride up the Golden Horn. Now we know that the terminal for the boat to take us up there is just a little further upstream past these fish restaurants. So I walked up that way but couldn't see any signs 
and had to ask several times where the terminal was. After some time I saw what I took to be a cafe so walked in there to ask them then sat down and asked for a cup of tea. The cup of tea was immediately and graciously given to me but they wouldn't take any payment. Actually I think I had wandered into a staff restaurant for the ferry employees. Can you imagine what would happen if a foreigner did something like that in London? Anyway, I did eventually find the boat and we're now sailing up the Golden Horn. We're going to get off at Aup, which I presume is the Yorkshire quarter of Istanbul. You will have noticed on the way up that there are quite a few mosques which we haven't seen yet. Ah, well look now, we're here at Aup. Actually, we're here at Aup mainly to look at a mosque, would you believe? This is a special mosque, a place of pilgrimage. Aup is located just outside the old city walls of Constantinople and in 1453, whilst the city was being besieged by the Turks. The Sultan, Mehmed the Conqueror, or it could have been one of his viziers, had a dream which directed him to the unmarked grave of Heber Eup el Ensari. Just notice while we're here in the courtyard that across there is the mausoleum which we'll mention shortly. The mausoleum now holds the body of Ayub el ensari and he was the standard bearer of the Prophet Muhammad and he died here during the Arab attack on Constantinople which took place in the 7th century. That attack, along with quite a few others over the course of time, was unsuccessful. But as we know, the attack by Mehmed in 1453 succeeded and the mosque was constructed soon afterwards as a shrine along with the mausoleum. Now whilst I was sat here, a man, I think it might have been the Imam, came over and poured a little oil or holy water or something onto my left hand. I don't know how he knew about my left hand, I'm sure. Anyway, the original mosque was demolished by an earthquake in 1800 and the Sultan of that time, Selim III, had the present mosque built to replace it. During the Ottoman Empire, each new sultan was girded here with the sword of Osman, which was the symbol of sovereignty. Let's have a brief look at the mausoleum. The mausoleum has this wishing window, so I wished that my left hand problem and all the MND would go away. Our next visit will be to the Church of St. Saviour in Cora. Normally I would have walked there but decided to hail a taxi. I want to tell you this story because of what happened. I don't think I've ever hailed a taxi before, even in England. Well, I wasn't making a very good job of it, and after a few minutes, a chap came over, a local chap presumably, and hailed one for me. I suppose I'm being a bit naive as usual, but I was getting quite used to living in a civilised country, 